Every year, just before Easter, the Rally World superstars come to pit their wits and their machines against Africa. The Marlborough Safari Rally has justifiably come to be regarded as the ultimate rally challenge. For victory here in Kenya means more than in any single motoring event in the world. And Africa too eagerly awaits a glimpse of the gleaming supercars that will once again be offered up to her roads in a brutal war of attrition. The Peugeot 205 Turbo 16, undisputed world rally leader with a string of recent successes under its belt, but yet to come to terms with the safari. The new Audi Quattro Sport. The Germans have added a six-speed gearbox to this, their third crack at that elusive crown. And so, from France and from Germany, from Italy and, of course, Japan, they've come to take part in the 1985 Marlborough Safari Rally, an event that will once again live up to its name as the world's greatest rally. the start the teams are out testing testing the cars testing the roads testing themselves for the slightest flaw in their preparation those who know will tell you you need a lot of luck in the safari as well as meticulous planning and preparation Bjorn Valdegard winner here last year I don't rely on anything more than that we know we have done a very good preparation both uh, from the practice side of you and uh, the cars are well prepared at home in the workshop but they are saying it will come back. So, middle of the rally, they say we are getting a lot of rain. What are Hanu Mikola's ideal conditions? Oh, it can be raining. It's no problem for us. As usual, the talk here is about rain. The heavy clouds overhead bode well for the four-wheel drive teams. I hope they share with the local farmers. Though Lancia's Marku Allen shrugged it off. No, no, no. It's heavy rain, that's a problem at the Micah, but only shower like this is not a big problem. During scrutineering at a Nairobi police test center, it's the weather that gets the compulsory inspection as well as the cars. For the man who currently sits at the top of the World Drivers' Championship, just five words say it all. I am ready to start. You can't win the safari just by having a lot of money. You must be able to do something, to improvise, and work hard. We've got, a, we've got to attack right from the start and hope to survive. Jekka Mehta, the Kenyan rally king. Can he win this event for a sixth time? What are his predictions? Well, I think in the first leg, you'll find the most incredible Grand Prix. Um, you'll get 20 cars really, really fighting very hard. Second leg, I think the fight will go on. Beginning of the third leg, it'll be quite interesting to see who's still there with a chance to win. And um, my suspicion is that modern cars are so good that you're going to still find half a dozen cars that are still running relatively problem-free and quite near to each other. So I think it'll be a race right to the finish. The Kenyatta International Conference Center in Nairobi, start of the Marlborough Safari Rally. A memorial to President Yomo Kenyatta, who led Kenya to its independence in 1963. Headquarters for the rally, the center is packed with all the communications equipment needed to control an event of this significance. Significant for the impact on the 1985 World Rally Championship and significant for a country that each successive year manages to turn a motor rally into a state occasion. In a parade of honor, and like the tight-knit family unit they are, Toyota Team Europe arrived. They won here last year, now can they do it again? Bjorn Valdegard, the man who drove them to victory last year, admits he's been bitten by the safari bug. But then he's the only overseas driver to have won the event twice. This year, he brings along a protégé, Juha Kankinen, a young, ambitious Finn, hoping to follow in the footsteps of his more illustrious countryman, Hanu Mikola, of Audi. President Daniel Arap Moy, the man who took over the reins of his country from President Kenyatta on his death in 1978, welcomes the crowds who throng to the capital to witness the start of the 33rd Safari Rally. An event which will span five days and four nights and cover nearly 5,200 kilometers of the toughest terrain imaginable. Kenya is proud of its rally. Tens of thousands of its people will line the route. 
This is their show, and they know that in spite of satellite TV to tens of millions more throughout the world, they have the ringside seats on the drama that is about to unfold. First from the ramp is the Audi Quattro Sport of Hanu Mikola and Swedish co-driver Arne Hertz, seasoned professionals with a new six-speed gearbox, backup helicopter and nearly 80 factory mechanics to ensure success this year. In spite of rolling the car six times during practice, the Audi has proved stunningly reliable and the team is in a buoyant mood. Anu Mikola became the first overseas driver to win a safari rally in 1972 and he's been seeking that elusive second win ever since. He finished third here last year in the only works Audi to finish. But for now, 14 hours of solid driving lie ahead and thoughts are only on the first leg, thought to be the easiest of the three. The Opal Manta of Rauno Altonen and Lofty Drews is second off the ramp. Altonen is competing in his 22nd successive safari and has managed to come second no less than four times. Always a bridesmaid, but never the bride. Last year's winner, Bjorn Valdegard, in a stronger and more powerful version of the victorious Toyota Celica Turbo. Valdegard and co-driver Hans Thorzelius luckily survived a high-speed crash with an Impala during practice. A familiar wave from the local man who's won the safari five times, Marlborough's Shekha Mehta in the Nissan 240RS. Behind Mehta in his fifth successive safari, Timo Salonen in the first of the Peugeot 205 turbos. Fresh from his win on the Swedish, Ari Vatanen is in the second Peugeot. A winner here in 1983 for Opel, he's the current favourite for the title this year. The first of the Lanciers is driven by the courageous and talented Attilio Bettiga, making his first appearance in Africa and a cautious start to his safari debut. Lancia has been afflicted with jamming gearboxes during practice, but these have now been replaced. And the second of the lighter and more powerful O37s is in the hands of Finland's Marku Allen, renowned for his flair and high-speed action. His safari rally was ruined for him by mechanical failure last year, but the reigning world champion Stig Blomqvist in the second Audi is brimming with confidence. Another newcomer to the safari is Bruno Sabi in the third Peugeot entry. Twice winner of the French National Championship, Sabi's co-driver is Jean-Francois Fauchy. Rally champion for three years, Jan Shah is in a Nissan 240RS taking on his 10th safari. Another Kenyan driver, Vic Preston Jr., in the third Lancia. Last year he was sixth, but he's fresh from victory in the Coast 600 rally in January. In the works Toyota Turbo sits local driver David Horsey. But pressure is sure to be applied by Mike Kirtland in his Nissan 240RS. In all, 71 cars will leave the Kenyan capital at two-minute intervals for the first leg of this, the 33rd Safari Rally. A very fast Grand Prix of a leg with 1,647 kilometers of driving from Nairobi down past the base of Mount Kilimanjaro and the dreaded Taita Hills to Mombasa on the coast, then through the night back up to Nairobi. there's little change in the start positions. But in less than 200 kilometers from the start, shock waves are striking the Audi sport team. Blomqvist has been having problems selecting gears. 
There are problems too for the other four-wheel drive favourites, Peugeot. Loose turbo pipes are hampering two of the team's three cars. Sabi is slipping back and so too is Salomon, who'd left Nairobi hours earlier at the head of the Peugeot pack. He's lost 12 minutes already. At an alarmingly early stage in this most unpredictable of rallies, the sophisticated might of the supercars is being questioned. early stage, observers begin to take note of Erwin Weber in the second Opel Manta. This is the young German's first safari, though he's no stranger to the trials and tribulations of the Kenyan terrain, having driven a chase car for the Opel team last year. High up in the tighter hills, life for some goes on as normal. Whilst for others, it's getting tough. A rally, despite the speed and the risks, is not a race. Positions on the road don't represent placings on the leaderboard. Competitors are battling against the clock. The Marlborough Safari Rally has 99 control points. Ideal times are set between each. Lost time means lost points, unless drivers can make up the difference between the controls. Points are worked out in minutes, and drivers can be penalised even for arriving at a time control early. Drivers have to steer a tactical course between preserving their cars when time allows and subjecting them to the limits of mechanical endurance should the need arise. It's the lively Lanciers who are leading in a heady display of speed and style. Italian Attilio Bettigo is in second place in only his first safari and he's separated from teammate Marco Allen in first place by only a minute. Three minutes separates the top ten cars but in the safari you can't afford to take anything for granted. A puncture can lose you vital minutes and several places. Further down the ladder there's no shortage of drama either. Sabi's Peugeot struggles on hampered by continued turbo pipe trouble. Shah's aggressive attack is pushing his Nissan 240 to its limit. Vic Preston Jr. in the third Lancia may be running somewhere down the field, but he's sharing second place with teammate Bettiger on the leaderboard. David Horsey still hasn't come to terms with his factory Toyota and he's being pushed hard by Mike Kirtland. And still Erwin Weber piles on the pressure, obviously putting his recent experience in the Paris-Dakar raid rally to good use here. Waiting for mechanics to come to their aid by helicopter has cost Salonen and co-driver Seppo Harayani dearly in their troubled Peugeot. But they now seem to be staging a recovery. For the latest addition to the ranks of the Finnish rally stars, Juha Kankinen, there seems to be little to worry about. In a steady and sensible drive in his Celica, he's holding his place in the field, a departure from his normal hard-charging style. But where is Audi? In a controversial but necessary step, the team from Ingolstadt has reduced its entry from four to two cars. Both have been plagued by gearbox troubles. For Stig Blomqvist, the safari has come to a premature end, leaving only Mikola to fly the Audi flag. However, he's over an hour behind the leaders as they arrive in Mombasa after a solid six and a half hours behind the wheel. Rested but wary of the hazards hidden in the dark of an African night, 
the team set off on the long haul back up to Nairobi. Only five minutes separates the top ten cars. Sheka Mehta is content to lie in joint ninth position. A tactical driver, this successful Nairobi businessman, doesn't like to be ahead at such an early stage in the safari. Behind him on the road, but in joint second, Ari Vatinen's Peugeot is thought to be favourite to push ahead if the weather turns and the going gets muddy. The sturdy four-wheeler would be able to overhaul the light two-wheel drive Lancius. But here is Bettiger lying in first position. Marco Allen is in joint second, only a minute behind his teammate. And only a minute behind Allen is the third Lancia driven by Preston Jr., the local driver with a huge reputation for speed and sheer nerve. Weber's Opel pulls away in a comfortable joint fifth. Even in this early stage in the rally, weary private entries are finding themselves checking in long after the rested leaders have left for Nairobi. Kankanen waits for the countdown. severe enough to worry the two-wheel drive cars. Batinen in the four-wheel drive Peugeot is piling on the pressure, the conditions suiting him perfectly. Sadly, we hear that teammate Savvy is out. Had Lancia's charge at the top seemed too good to be true. For now, constant running at speeds of over 220 kilometers per hour has shaken up the suspension systems to a worrying degree. The third Lancia found itself without a throttle, and Preston Jr. had to rig a hand cable, losing precious time as a result. By safari standards, the attrition rate is high. The casualty list grows. Towards the end of the first leg, this is the only Audi left in the running, the privately entered Quattro 80 of Basil Criticos. the tattered remnants of this year's onslaught on Africa weave through the villages of the Machakas Hills. The talk at the time controls is of major changes in the leaderboard. The Lancia challenge is finished. Marco Allen has gone out with a blown engine, Bettiger has lost his lead with a broken fuel pump, and Preston Jr. has had ignition failure on top of his throttle problems. For those making it back to Nairobi at the end of this fearsome first leg, there's now time for urgent repairs and service. But on the safari, you can never relax. Even out of the car, old hands like Sheka Mehta find time for caution. No, I was having a little bit of trouble changing gear. So we're changing a gearbox for safety. I'm sure it's all right. I'm sure it's just in the mind. Having replaced the gearbox, the mechanics are now fitting a complete new rear axle as a precaution. The smoothly rehearsed techniques are timed to the split second. The whole team is working against the clock. Tell them they've got seven minutes left. Seven minutes to fit a rear axle. 
What would normally take hours for a garage to do is handled in minutes by an experienced and practiced rally crew. Meta is happy. The Nissan now has a completely new transmission. To him, it feels like a new car, and he's driving into Nairobi in third place. Ahead of Meta in second place is Erwin Weber, who helps direct mechanics stripping down his Opel Manta. This is routine service after a day and night of driving, but the kind of work a normal car wouldn't need even after five years of motoring. A new rear axle, like the Nissan team, replaced as a matter of course. To the young Weber, everything is looking good. Small problem is uh, band belt. Everything is okay on the car. No major problems with the car. No of the original 71 starters, only 38 made it back to Nairobi. The 1985 Safari is living up to expectations and is already carving its place in rally history. Bjorn Valdegard is in lead position now, having made the most of Lancia's misfortune on the way back from Mombasa. He's in exactly the same position as this time last year, and the Toyota is going well. Valdegard's rise isn't all down to the misfortune of others. Valdegard has driven tactically and wisely, and knows there's no letting up in the safari. Weber, who surprised the rally world with his dashing drive to second place, is only six minutes behind the old master. The young, inexperienced 25-year-old is already being described by the Opal team boss Tony Fall as a man with the will and the skill to win. No one in Nairobi underestimates the established and unsurpassed ability of Meta and his co-driver Rob Coombs. Only a minute separates their Nissan 240 from Weber's Opel. It's now that the man the world calls Master of the Safari is planning his attack. Before starting the event this year, he said his tactic would be to hold back because of the superiority of cars like Audi and Peugeot. Now that's changed, he feels on top form. The spectators, perhaps, Meta's style is relaxed and confident, yet inwardly he's pumping adrenaline and preparing yet again to spend hours driving to the limit of his own and his car's performance. Teammates Mike Kirkland and Anton Levitin aren't far behind. Only one minute separates them. They're sharing fourth position with Yuha Kankanen and co-driver Fred Gallagher from Northern Ireland. Rauno Altenen's all-or-nothing attempt for 1985 has so far been frustrated by broken alternator brackets. The first-place car is only a tantalizing nine minutes ahead of his Opel. And there's a big gap separating him from the seventh-place Vatinen Peugeot, which first of all suffered strut failure and then electrical problems with a fuel pump. Alain Ambrosino is six minutes behind in his Nissan 240. This is his second safari and experience gained at his home event, the Marlborough Ivory Coast Rally, is paying dividends. Lancia's early lead is now reduced to ninth and tenth positions with Bettiger, the team's big hope, just ahead of Preston Jr. The second leg of the safari is to cover nearly 2,000 kilometers through what's known here as up country. From the great rift valley, they sweep around the shores of Lake Victoria, over the equator and up into the semi-desert land near the Ugandan border. Through forests and mountain country with altitudes of over 8,000 feet, this is wild territory. And still, the talk is of heavy rain expected in the northwest. Instead, the second leg starts with that dread of all rally drivers, dust. Vast clouds of it, giving leader Valdegard the advantage he has been looking for and enabling him to force the pace of the rally, just as he did last year. 
His lead has increased to 12 minutes over Weber. Meta is driving as confidently and smoothly as only he knows how. In spite of a car suffering with alternator problems, Mike Kirtland's Nissan is getting into the competition now. Pushing on is Juha Kankinen, who's earlier managed to drive off the road into a swamp and lost precious minutes while waiting for help to push him back into the rally. Opel Team Europe have fitted full-spec Phase 3 engines to their cars here this year, and the extra power is put to good use by Altenen and Lofty Drews. Peugeot have won the Safari six times before. Vatanen needs to capitalize on the conditions here, which are suiting his 205. The new men of Nissan, Alain Ambrosino and Danny Lasso, are looking comfortable. Throughout this Good Friday, the top cars have been locked in the same position. The cars enter their second African night with a lineup so close that even a minor incident could mean a major shake-up of names on the leaderboard. Saturday morning, and as expected, the 1985 Marlborough Safari Rally sees another round of changes. Vatanen is proving himself fastest on the road and has moved up to fifth position. And there's a new leader. First place now belongs to Rauno Altanen, looking good in the position he's held on many previous safaris, yet in two decades of attempts has failed to hold. Behind him on the road, the only Lancia left in the running. It's Vic Preston Jr. mounting a solo attack now after his teammate Bettiger's retirement with a blown engine. Preston Jr. is now in joint sixth place and with service teams able to concentrate solely on his car, he's driving flat out. Weber is steady in second place, only five minutes behind his Opel teammate. Still driving an immaculate rally, Weber has held first place for a brief spell in the early hours of the morning. But his young counterpart in Team Toyota, Yuha Kankinen, is also moving up and is now in third place and only three minutes behind Weber. The Finn's restrained style is paying off, but his teammate, last night's leader Valdegard, is running late. Meta's planned attack has not worked out. He came off the road and lost 20 minutes trying to restart, which has let Kankinen through. Bjorn Valdegard has dropped to eighth. Alternator failure and then a broken rear damper. Valdegard is in no mood for going into detail. Uh, okay. No, it's okay again, but we have some electrical problem this uh, night. In spite of his own electrical problems, Mike Kirtland is lying in joint sixth place and is now nearly half an hour ahead of Valdegard. The Nissan Works team has all its cars in the top ten places, with their third driver, Ambrosino, holding on to ninth position, 17 minutes behind Valdegard, and over 40 minutes separating him from Salonen's troubled Persia. It's been a frustrating safari for Salonen, who's been telling mechanics that he's lucky to go 100 kilometers without a fault developing. His latest setbacks include a failed alternator, another loose turbo pipe, and a high-speed tire blowout, which has torn off this front wing. He's now over two hours behind the leader. Rally is now at the halfway stage and drivers are having to compensate for their fatigue by finding the secret reserves of concentration that only men like this can muster. Like the finely tuned cars they drive, if the performance isn't 100%, they're out of the running. Sheka Meta handles the might of his Nissan's 275 brake horsepower with the skill and dexterity that only years of experience can muster. At a split second's notice, he knows when to flick the tail out to set the car up for manoeuvres ahead. Movements of the wheel which would defy the logic of a normal motorist are instinctive parts of a rally driver's control. 
with the continual foot play between clutch, brake and throttle, driving like this demands fitness of the body as well as the mind. No two rally drivers are the same in their style and approach. Bjorn Valdegard, one moment the leader but now a whole hour behind, knows that in the safari all is never lost until the last possible minute. Not for nothing is he known as the fox of African rallying. The Toyota Celica's 350 brake horsepower in the hands of a driver like Valdegard can exceed 230 kilometers an hour, more than 140 miles per hour. World Championship leader Timo Salonen knows well one of the side effects of driving on the limit. The relentless barrage of shock waves through the spine and muscles meant that Salonen had to receive surgery for a back injury last year. Behind the wheel of his car, Salonen has a chilling capacity to make the most daring maneuvers at the highest speeds. A slippery track with a deep ravine alongside is to Salonen just another road requiring a swift opposite lock from the wheel. of steel and his agile command of a car is awesome. Just imagine driving like this for five days and four nights. But miles ahead of him, Vic Preston Jr. in his 037 Lancia is now first on the road and setting a furious pace in his fight for fifth position. He's three minutes ahead of Kirkland with whom he had previously shared sixth place and Lancia's last hope has gained a minute on Vatanen in the Peugeot. But the little car is now at peak performance, and Peugeot hopes are still pinned on reports of slippery conditions ahead. Altenen is still maintaining first position with no major problems reported, though an oil leak is worrying mechanics who've been unable to trace it. Weber, keeping up with his senior partner's pace, is still five minutes behind and still surprising safari veterans with his cool, calm, collected standard of driving. Now fourth place, Meta is putting everything into his drive, but he's up against another faultless performance from Kankinen. Within is now feeling the pressure of having to lead the Toyota attack. Voldegaard may be 50 minutes behind his teammate, but on the road he's charging on, with all the flair which has so often before brought him out of the rear placings. Mike Kirtland in seventh place is 17 minutes ahead of the Swede, and his Nissan shows no sign of slowing down. His teammate Ambrosino is now over an hour behind in ninth place. Tenth car, Timo Salonen's Peugeot, is showing signs of recovery. Just outside the Elderet time control, Vatanen's Peugeot exposes all for a very necessary service halt. Vatanen had expected to be in third place at this stage before a stone put an end to the plan. Wedging itself in a rear brake caliper, the wheel jam solid, ripping off the disc. Mechanics make repairs which include a caliper replacement along with a new drive shaft and wishbones as a precaution. 14 minutes ahead of him on the clock, Kankinen comes in for service. Replacement parts are laid out ready for a meticulous operation. Particular attention is paid to the suspension. The car has been specially strengthened for this year's event. Even so, the mechanics want to ensure it's holding up. New front struts are fitted in record time. 
Survival in the safari always depends on the efficiency of the backup teams. Kankinen is almost relaxed. It's all routine. Just San Pedro and Tires. <laughs> For Rauno Altonen, still in the lead, there's no slowing down. Kankinen is out of service and he's checking through the L Direct control and he's still in contention with Meta, who's only three minutes behind on the leaderboard and now even closer on the road. As tension mounts for everybody, Kankinen backs up. A mistake on the check card? A frustrating few seconds is all it takes and Meta makes the most of it. Kirkland is trying to regain the three minute difference which Preston Jr. has put between them. Right behind him, the Toyota of Valdegard. The forecast of rain in the northwest section has not come true, but Lancia's last hope, Preston Jr., keeps pressing his Lancia on. Altonen follows as they charge towards the Mao escarpment, where rain has fallen, making practice notes useless. Vatanen, and close behind Weber, as the front runners brace themselves for yet another shake-up in the leadership stakes. With only 11 minutes separating the first four cars, the 1985 Safari Rally is still wide open. Kankinen is third. In the afternoon sunshine, Meta looks good, but he's heading for a disastrous crash which will wreck his hopes for this safari. Nissan's hopes will soon lie with this man, Mike Kirkland, but he's having transmission problems. Salonen is suffering turbo failure and has lost an hour. We're to learn that Ari Vatanen's rally is over with a blown engine. Preston Jr. in the last Lancia is also out. It's Valdegard who reaps the benefit of this havoc, moving from 8th to 4th place. Midnight outside Nairobi, and Opel are in full control of the rally as team boss Tony Ford talks logistics to Altonen and co-driver Lofty Drews. Yeah, right, we've got a, a vehicle there with two men in it. Yeah. Meanwhile, mechanics prepare the Manta for the final leg. The oil leak appears to have been stopped, but there are other problems. We lost the brakes about 150 kilometers from here, and I then adjusted my brakes fully on the front axle, which they were, but front brakes only and some air in the brakes still wasn't enough to stop the car, so it was uh, a bit hair raising and I was even sweating in the pumps. Altenen was making his name winning the European Rally Championship in 1965 when Erwin Weber was in his first year at school. The young German is only eight minutes behind his teammate and the man they call the Rally Professor. Erwin Weber personally checks every piece of work on his car. The Opel team appear calm and calculated about their performance. I think we will try to finish the third leg as well as the last two. Easter Sunday in Nairobi heralds the start of the third and final leg of the 1985 Marlborough Safari Rally. Less than a third of the original number of entries remain in the rally. Just 22 cars left to start the fourth day of a marathon test of endurance that's already broken all expectations of the four-wheel drive super teams. Altonen's experience and the trusty Opel's conventional engineering lead this rally, and in the safari veteran's shadow, few here are now underestimating the chances of Weber in the second Opel. Or indeed, the threat from another young and virtually unknown name in rallying, Juha Kankanen.
The afternoon skies above Nairobi show no signs of the threatened rain, and the drivers, weary now, are hoping it will stay that way. Downpours on this final leg will guarantee the worst possible conditions. With only 13 minutes separating the top three cars, the gap widens to nearly 50 minutes between Kankinen and the fourth place Valdegard, who never gives up. The Swedes' trusty Toyota is only one minute ahead of Kirkland, who, before reaching Nairobi last night, not only had gearbox trouble, but also suffered a broken drive shaft. The astonishing rate of attrition amongst the professionals of the works teams has allowed the privateers to penetrate the top ten. Two private Nissans and a Subaru are in the running, although whole hours separate them from works drivers like Ambrosino. The Peugeot of Timo Salonen is the only four-wheel drive car left in the top ten. It's lying in seventh place, but three hours behind the leading car as the survivors of this test of stamina and strength head north on this, the shortest and most lethal last leg. Once again, they tear up the Rift Valley, around the beautiful Lake Naivasha, and then through some of the most spectacular scenery in Kenya. Spectacular might be the scenery, but the ribbon of dirt track is riddled with deadly mud holes. And then the final sting, the slopes of Mount Kenya and the foothills of the Aberdare Mountains. More than 1,500 kilometers of final challenge. This safari is now developed into a straight fight between Opel and Toyota. The dust clouds may have disappeared, but slithery mud is another challenge. On sections where making up time is the only formula for maintaining any kind of lead, risks have to be taken. Altonen is now driving flat out through the mud. Weber's still there, his technique closely matching that of his teammate ahead. But just how deep are those mud holes? There's no way of knowing and Kankinen takes the cautious route round. Valdegard is safely through this section, but it's Mike Kirkland who's piling on tremendous pressure, having survived a half-shaft failure and is appearing easily the fastest on this section. And the second Nissan left in the rally, Alain Ambrosino. In all of his 22 attempts at victory in the safari, Altonen now feels this is the firmest grip he's had on the lead. But now there's a new sound to add to the shouts of encouragement, that of a slipping clutch. Year after year, the people of Kenya have followed the Finn's attempts at victory. He has support all over the country, but that isn't enough to help him, as Weber, driving faster than ever, is well poised now to take the lead. And still the Toyota challenge is getting stronger, with Kankinen inexorably closing the gap. The fourth and final night of the safari promises to be rough. Only 22 lonely crews will creep to the final time control early on Sunday morning.
Just when they're having suspension problems, the Toyota team hears news of a breakthrough. Kankinen is now in second place because Altenen has had to have the clutch replaced on the Manta. This means that Kankinen is now only 10 minutes behind the new leader, Weber, providing no more time is lost at this service. The situation is so tense that the young Finn chooses to join in rather than rest. The last day dawns and the drama continues. In spite of his lead position on the road, Valdegard has been held up by a broken rear damper mounting and he's now dropped to joint third. But, for all the world, it looks as if Weber is about to write his name in the history books. Mike Kirtland, in joint third, has been driving exceptionally well. The reliability of his Nissan gaining him valuable time. It's the same story with Ambrosino, though he's an hour behind the next man. Rauno Alternant is in fifth and looks unlikely to threaten the first places. Salonen has been dogged by a costly series of minor faults, but he's determined to finish. The Peugeot is now going well, but he's too far back to be a serious threat to any of the leaders. But it's not only the works entries that are still going. This is a privately entered Nissan looking surprisingly good for this stage in the safari. Kankinen's Toyota has been suffering the same suspension problems as Valdegard and now is 25 minutes behind leader Weber who has less than 200 miles to go. The tension is mounting. Valdegard comes in having won his tussle with Mike Kirtland. And Rauno Altenen clinging on grimly. But suddenly, the Opel support aircraft starts relaying messages. Incredibly, Weber has stopped with engine trouble. In a dramatic 100 mile per hour crash, Mike Kirtland has rolled the Nissan. Willing hands turned him over again, and he's carrying on, minus windscreens back and front, and damaged steering with his chase car in hot pursuit. sensational turn of events, Team Toyota are heading into Nairobi with their second successive safari win. Weber's problems have dropped him to fifth place, giving Kankinen the lead. Valdegard in the second Toyota, fighting his way into second place. Rauno Altenen is leading the dejected Opel entry home, having to settle for fourth place. A sad end to a fine effort. Weber is an hour behind trying to come to terms with his mechanical fate that has robbed him of victory only miles from the end. For Mike Kirtland, it's been a race from start to finish. On his own admission, he's lucky still to be going after a crash that would have wrecked an ordinary saloon. He'll take third position, 11 minutes ahead of alternate. Alain Ambrosino spun his Nissan in the same mud hole as Kirkland, but managed to avoid the crash. He'll finish in sixth place overall.
The victory will go to Yuha Kankanen, who, together with Fred Gallagher, in a well-placed drive that has borne all the hallmarks of his team leader, Valdegard, will carry off one of rallying's most treasured crowns. Five days, four nights, and over 5,000 kilometers of driving come to an end. It's been one of the most closely fought safaris yet, and one that has defied all the predictions. The Marlborough Safari Rally is the ultimate challenge, and the victor can hardly credit what's happening. A 200 to 1 outsider is about to enter the world record books. A man with no previous safari experience driving for a team which came here for the first time last year and won takes the laurels for them again. The Finns have seen their drivers win here before, but this man has surprised them all. In Nairobi, they're calling it a fairy tale win. The 1985 Marlborough Safari Rally is Juha Kankanen's first world championship win. The world's greatest rally has produced its most sensational result yet. Finland has a new hero and the world has a new rally The dust and heat of Africa. The power and speed of modern rally cars driven to the limit. Together, they create the drama and excitement of the greatest, toughest rally event in the world. Mm -hmm. 